So welcome and uh, thank you so much. Uh, Moriba sent me an email a little while ago that said, uh, would you be interested in moderating a panel on air and orbital space integration? And that's an issue that's near and dear to me. In fact, the first time I attended this very conference, the paper I wrote was the need for an integrated regulatory framework for air and space. So I was very happy that he asked me to moderate this. And then he said, and get me a dream team. So uh, we did. And I'm very excited to introduce this panel. Do we have Michael on Zoom? I'm online. Yeah, there he is. OK, fantastic. So I'm going to quickly introduce the panel and give each one of them five minutes to talk about their perspective on this particular issue. Uh, our first presenter, I wish we had his face. That's all right. Ah, oh, it's too bad. It's a face you're all familiar with. Uh, Michael Kazarian, he's joining us from Paris, and he has a very familiar face, even though we can't see it right now. He is the president of the International Space Safety Foundation, an adjunct professor at USC, where he teaches engineering and space safety, and a former technical fellow at Boeing. His paper and a frequent speaker on the topic of protecting airspace from space debris. So following on from these questions that we just had. And then immediately to my right, we have Janet Tinoco, a systems engineer, a professor at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. She teaches strategy, leadership, innovation, and sustainability. She has 35 years of experience, and she is the lead author of a textbook that was published a year ago called Introduction to Space Force, Runways to Space. So she is our expert on getting from, from Earth to space. And you may have read some of her papers on the launch impact on civil aviation and hazard areas. Next year, we have Therese Jones. She is the Senior Director of Policy at the Satellite Industries Association. She supports work on regulatory, legislative, defense, space sustainability, cybersecurity, and export control. She was formerly a policy researcher at RAND. She's a policy analyst, an astrophysicist, and a strategist. We could not ask for a more well-rounded perspective for this panel, so thank you so much. And finally, we have someone who is a new fresh face for the space community, Nancy Graham. For some of you, you may have never seen her or heard her speak, but we are very, very lucky to have her because in aviation, she is one of the most familiar faces. She is a global policy leader. For years, we have talked in this community about governance on orbit. We look to ICAO as an example. Some have even proposed an ICAO for space. So for many years in air traffic management, Nancy was ICAO. As the director of the ICAO Air Navigation Bureau, she led global innovation standards for ATM and recognizing the overlapping interests of launch, particularly but commercial space in the aviation community. She launched the ICAO commercial space portfolio, work that had not been done at that entity before. She's since worked with Google X and other innovators in unmanned aircraft. And she is the president of the Laura Tabor Barber Air Safety Foundation. So, you wanted a dream team, more of us? I brought you. <laughs> so, uh, with that, I will give each of our presenters, in the order I described my five minutes to talk about where they see this issue, what is most important. And, Michael, we're going to start with you. Well, thank you for having there, me here today. And I wish I could be with you in person. Uh, one of the interests that I've had these last few years is the interface between the airspace and the space environment. I know uh, Kevin O'Connell just spoke that what go happens in space stays in space, but my concern is what goes up must come down. As we put up more satellites, as we have uh, the recent announcement of 100,000 satellites from one web potentially, uh, international partners and in foreign countries, uh, we must think about what's going to happen with all those objects when they've come when they come down and enter pass through the airspace. You know, it's a little bit like shooting a gun up in the air, worrying if it's something they should worry about. And uh, but I think that that we should start thinking about how to integrate the space environment and protect all users of the airspace to prevent a potential catastrophe. The Aerospace um, Corporation has done studies to quantify this risk. And this risk is actually not a zero number. It is a number that we should all be concerned about. Not so concerned that we don't go outside or get on airplanes and fly to conferences, but one that we should certainly think about implementing mitigation strategies while we have the potential to do so. One of the biggest problems 
is not understanding when these objects will enter, not understanding what will survive reentry, but it's about communicating this information in a timely manner to the pilot in command in the airspace. And with the availability of tools that exist now, we can start to develop systems to protect those. And I want to encourage this community to think about that and call for changes because it's not really an expensive thing to do in the grand scheme of things, and one that we can uh, do so in a very orderly and methodo methodical manner before we have to do that following an incident. Thanks, that was a pretty nice thing, so I'll be out there. Um, so thank you very much. And if we could go very quickly to Janet so that you can share, uh, and I believe you have some slides for us. Okay, so while that's while that's getting ready, I thank you both for I was overwhelmed. And every everybody, thank you for being here. Um Great. I actually just have a few slides because um, I want to take this roof out and take some of this first course discussion. And so I'm just, just hoping we can do it or you know, truly hope or that they're meant to be. Um, in 2017, the FAA opened a 21 orbital of non flight squirrel fly. A year later, we had one board that went by the bar. So first, sorry to be here. Can we, I just want to make sure that thing's working. Can you tap it? Just tap it a little bit closer. Um, right. Rocket Lab came to be, of course. So in 2021, the Bryce report just came out. Um, I had to count all those little funky little planet orbiting things and all those things. And I don't mean for you to count them. But the point is that in 2021, so just th three years later, we now have 50 launch sites that support our, our orbital launch and 46 that support suborbital launch. It's a lot, right? And one can argue that maybe, you know, some were missing from the earlier uh, descriptions, but nonetheless, I think this is really eye opening. So more closely in the United States, for those of us that are in the United States, in 2016, there were nine FAA licensed spaceports, five were proposed. 2020, and I actually wanna to point to the far left on the proposed side, now there are 13 spaceports, licensed spaceports that includes launch and return, and another 12 proposed. Um, and recently, of course, we added Camden, it's now also licensed. Few more figures, the FAA licensed and permitted launch and entry operation in 2016, there were 17 in the United States. In 2021, there were 64, 73% increase. I've heard proposals from other people that uh, we need more spaceports, uh, maybe with certain airspace classifications like airports. Um, and I've heard uh, arguments the other way and our keynote speaker kind of mentioned that, well, maybe we should just stop until we figure everything out. Uh, but the point is commercial space, uh, commercial aviation, they are impacting each other. And now we have a situation where there are ships that are causing launches to be scrubbed. If everybody knows what happened to SpaceX, I think last, last month with respect to cruise ships. Um, so I'm kind of of the, you know, what goes up might come down, we don't really know. But I do want to talk later on about a system of systems, because I think that's what we have. If you take, for instance, this airport slide, I can't vouch for the, uh, the accuracy on this, I just thought it was cool. <laughs> and you overlay that on this, you see what we have is a system of systems that need to be implemented. Thank you. Thank you. And now to give us you know, there's this growth in spaceports, but we all know there's a tremendous growth in satellites. So, um, and so there's great things. Present for more every lunch. <laughs> 
So thank you everyone for having me. I think it's my fourth time at this conference. I'm excited to be back in person. Um, so I'm at the Satellite Industry Association. We represent uh, uh, companies with uh, base, who are based in or have US interests um, from satellite operators, manufacturers, ground equipment suppliers, launch companies, some SSA data providers. And so we are clearly uh, the reason for this concern um, with air traffic management and the reason for the increase in congestion on orbit. Today, there are around 5,000 active satellites on orbit. And as I'm sure many of you know, the numbers have greatly increased in the past few years. Since I started this role in 2018, um, 2018, we had 468 satellites that were launched, 201 of which were from the US. In 2021, that total was 1,849 satellites, 1,256 of which were from the US. So massive increase in launches or of satellites launched. And in terms of what that translated to, in terms of overall numbers, in 2018, that was 114 launches, um, 34 of which were in the US. And in 2021, that number has increased to 146, 52 of which were in the US. We've also seen a transformation in how launch is done. We've seen quite a few companies coming online um, with small launch vehicles. Uh, there were 14 small launches in 2018, um, 30 in 2021. And I would say there's a lot of speculation about where that market is going, but I'm sure we'll see a change in dynamic and demand. And then we've also see, see, certainly seen a change in ride sharing as well that's transformed the way satellites are launched uh, with a number of different configurations for secondary payloads and companies that work exclusively on ride sharing and optimizing these launches. Now, looking ahead, um, as Kevin mentioned, we're expecting tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of satellites to launch in the next five to 10 years. So if you only look at Starlink alone, um, they are launching 50 satellites per launch right now on their Falcon 9. Uh, and to complete their uh, 42,000 uh, constellation, if they were to keep doing this on the Falcon 9, um, it would have take them 800 more launches to get there over the next five years, which would obviously be a dramatic increase um, in the number of launches overall. Um, they recently announced last month that they were planning on launching their second generation on Starship, um, which fits 400 satellites per launch um, or would require one eighth as many launches total. Um, so they seem to be thinking about sort of an economy of scale um, in launching. And we'll see if large launch vehicles also dramatically change this market and perhaps mitigate the impact um, on the aviation industry. There's certainly also a growing demand internationally for uh, both satellite services um, and launch sites as well as we saw with the spaceport map there. Um, and the internationalization will certainly require uh, more coordination on both these issues and you know the deorbiting that we'll talk a bit about later, I think. Um, and you know, as an association, we continuously want to think about how to maintain both U.S. leadership in space, both in satellite manufacturing uh, operations, and what, as well as launch, and be able to keep up with the capacity needs um, for the U.S. industry. Thanks. Thank you, Therese. And Nancy. I'll let y'all take it either one of you to do it. All right then. Thank you, Dr. Stillwell, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me. I don't know if I'm a fresh face, but I'm definitely a sage face. So during my eight years as the director of the International Civil Aviation Organization Safety and Air Navigation Bureau, I saw a need for, a, for both communities to learn from each other, the needs of aerospace to learn from you, and the needs of the space community to learn from our hard fought lessons in aviation. It was and continues to be my view that we, we do have a lot to learn from each other. The space community brings new thinking, new technology, new methods to assess and understand risk in our collective work. Aviation can, and in some sectors does, learn from this. Similarly, there are tried and true methods in aviation, the spirit of which can be used in the space sector. Ultimately, there's no singular UN organization for space. And even today, I don't believe we need one, and I'm going to tell you why. To act on my concern about the immigration, uh, one day I did something called a counterpart in the Office of Outer Space Affairs, and said, what do you do? And he said, search the job. And we had a nice chat. And I learned that most of their focus is on the legal aspects and trying to define where space should be. And then I think we can have a discussion, maybe I should be resolved. 
So we agreed that there needed to be some collaboration with these engineering organizations. For me, it was not intended to be an ICAO land grant or a community versus space grant, but rather an opportunity for these two organizations to collaborate for the greater good. Out of that initial call and call for partnership, we together worked on a series of symposium, which in UN terms is just a fancy word for an educational opportunity that doesn't require a lot of overhead. And there were a number of them held throughout the world over the last three or four years. The main objective of the symposiums was to bring together the representatives of the aviation community and the space community, including the commercial and private sector. And that's important because that is not normally a UN function. And to explore the existing regulatory mechanisms and operational practices in both aviation and space transportation. The series explored challenges and opportunities related to the emerging space activities, in particular, potential future, future space management, space traffic management in comparison with existing air traffic management practices. It also looked into the areas of protection for systems, assets, and infrastructure. This was one of the fundamental strengths of the series of symposiums, just to provide a cross-sectional platform where we can learn from each other, imagine these innovative approaches applying to each other and dialogue among the broader airspace community, including aviation, space activities, solar bulk flights, giving impetus to enhanced dialogue among all of the stakeholders. It was agreed that as a second phase of cooperation, we should establish something that I call the learning group. So it's not intended to develop regulation, it's intended for us to learn from one another and learn what the aviation community can do to foster a robust space community and what the space community can learn from the many, many years of, of uh, built on activity from the aviation community. And so with that in mind, this study group became uh, an ongoing learning activity. It still continues today at ICAO. And there's something I want to leave you with, which is the possibility for the resilience of the UN system. Look, it's not great, but it's what we got. So we have to leverage what we have in the UN system today that can help to without adding tremendous bureaucracy in the process. So there's a few secret code words that I want you to remember for the future. You heard earlier um, in, the, in, the, in the introduction that IAA is an observer in the UN system. That's code word for you don't get to play, you get to watch. That's not helpful. And that's true in the ICAO system as well. The states or the countries are the actors, and the industry is invited to watch as an observer. Personally, I found that offensive. Uh, so a lot of my contract shows that I'm invited to these things on a lot of countries. But it is an a, a old sort of concept that we need to change on the side. With that in mind, we put some language into the ICAO parlance that you can use for the future. So I'm going to read the ICAO parlance, and then I'm going to explain it to you. In recognizing the issues related to commercial space transport operations, potentially affecting international civil aviation, including the safe accommodation of commercial space transport operations in the airspace, and the work we spare for all other aviation infrastructure, that states, meaning this is directed to countries, and industry, that states and industry support ICAO activities in the commercial space field through the sharing of relevant expertise, B, share guidance material. I'm going to come back to that in a little bit. C, best practices and national provision related to commercial space operations in controlled airspace, including risk models and the application of relevant safety management principles. So that's all code for you don't necessarily agree, uh, need regulation immediately. In fact, the US is pretty much against that. And I agree with you that anything that's a knee jerk reaction is always a bad thing. What you do need, though, is a planned trajectory for what you will need in the future because it takes time to the UN system. I also don't think you need regulation. You need guidance. Regulation implies that there's a UN organization that is in support of and that regulates your field. I'm not sure that you need that. In fact, I'm pretty sure you don't. What you do need is harmonized guidance for those states, meaning countries, that don't have the capabilities as the front leaders. And they follow the mothership, and that's the UN organization. Guidance is the key word here, and that can be done without having oversight over the community. Use that. That mechanism is now in place. No one UN organization, UN organization has a mandate over space, and I don't think you need one. 
There are tools within the international framework that exist today in the Safari Group that we can that can be used to develop guidance that will help you in terms of educating the rest of the community, maybe you should read on what your needs are. So that tool is there for you to use. And it's there to allow for an integrated regulatory trajectory that you may need over time. So I leave you with that as knowing the tool is there for your use as you need it. Um, it's just now a question of who decided what you need from that community and uh, using the learning group to educate both. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. I think it's the first step you haven't heard before. So now this is a question and answer session. The key part of this is questions. I will need questions from you, but I will use my privilege as moderator to ask a few questions while the hands go up and then Morris says you have to stop asking this and then we'll come back. So I'm gonna start with a hard one. And uh, we all struggle with this question. There's no sovereignty in space, but there is absolute sovereignty over the airspace over one's territory. When we talk about launch, that's very clear. And John makes that very clear as well. A state can long license a spaceport. They can control who launches there and who doesn't launch there, deciding when and where. But with reentry, we don't have that concept because before, reentry was always seen as somewhat of a random activity. And I'm going to tell you a very short story. One of my last shifts is an air traffic controller in Miami. Come into the midnight, things get a little quiet. The watch desk came over and said, uh, Hey, Ruth, uh, Nora just called and said uh, there's possible re entry of space debris. They don't think we'll burn up in the atmosphere 25 miles east of Miami starting in three hours. And my response was, So do you want me to move airplanes, make a broadcast? Like, what is, what is our requirement? And they said, uh, I don't know. So this is the problem without having an integrated policy with the communities not talking to each other. So I said, uh, so traffic slow, we'll make, we'll make a broadcast. And so I did. And uh, you know, we have phraseology in air traffic control, had to make it up and it said, attention all aircraft, possible re-entering space debris, 25 miles east of Miami, starting at 0300. And a pilot keyed up and said, center, was that real? That's a problem. That's a problem that we need to deal with. So when we talk about uh, cleaning up space and cleaning up orbits by deorbiting, there's only so much the atmosphere can absorb. I mean, it doesn't burn up everything. And the response has been either do nothing, like we saw with the re-entering China satellite that was gonna be anywhere from 40 north to 40 south at three day period, and hoping for the best, to closing entire FIRs. What do we need to do differently to ensure the safety and thinking of this sovereignty question? If re-entries become more controlled and we can plan where and when it will happen as technology goes forward, what if states start saying no? And it is handled the same way as launches, where maybe you can re-enter in their airspace or maybe you can't. What impact does that have? So for everybody on the panel, I'm gonna ask and I'll start with uh, Michael, how do we plan for a better future than just hoping everything works out? Do we still have you, Michael? All right, then it's to you, Therese. You're right. So you need the microphone. Um, so I think, you know, one thing that you touched upon that's really important is the coordination piece. Um, that's something that's been very difficult, at least on the space um, side of space traffic management for us. And I think uh, likely the same on a controlled re-entry where, um, you know, like you said, uh, Uncontrolled reentry, you don't know where it's going to land. Um, but some states uh, may have better tracking information on this than others and may not be willing to provide that data. I think we it was a point of tension, at least in some of the Chinese cases, um, where we were not communicating very well. So I think open um, and transparent mechanisms for communication that exist um, prior to these incidents that occur for both the reentry side um, and on orbit operations is going to be critical. Um, and certainly any efforts to, uh, you know, encourage controlled re-entry of these objects um, will be important. Anyone else on the panel? 
I'm looking at it from a different point of view. I'm not a technician. I'm, I'm thinking of it as leveraging what we've learned that's worked in your community in the past. So what I, what I think is really interesting and what I remember as a young person growing up and watching the space community is that it came from a planetary point of view. I remember just being in awe and watching some of the early movies. And that kind of awe is something that we need to be reminded of. And it is something that has, one of the few things that's drawn the international community together is short of war, okay? So it's one of the positive things that's drawn the international community together. And look, depends on what the administration is in the US, what our policies are internationally. We get it, we're in a different time now, but Ultimately, I think we need to go back to re-educating ourselves and the community on what the value is in that collaboration. I like what you said, Kevin, about some of the services that we find today, we, we don't even know we're coming from space and that's gonna be more and more the case. What Elon Musk did the other day, like it or not, was enough to make you suck in air. So something a government couldn't do. So I, I think we have an opportunity to begin as a community to talk about the value that this provides and the opportunities to work together. We've got to come back to that. We're, the trajectory we're on is working with others is, is untenable uh, and will lead us only to one place. So I think we have to come back to somehow educating and creating that momentum that we had as working together as a broader community. The US has led that in the past. You know, there, We need to come back to that somehow. And others uh, uh, can follow along, but they do take a they do take a nod from what we do in the US. There are technical things we can come back to later in the discussion, but I think overall, some of that magic we have to bring back into how it inspired us and how it will inspire the future and what the challenges are if we don't. And speaking of technical answers, Michael, we have you back. I'm there. I didn't get the, un the mute button fast enough. So I will answer the question in two parts. First, you have to consider the uncontrolled reentry of debris that we don't have control over, obviously. And it's not a matter of closing all of the airspace. It's a matter of adjusting for a few minutes. And if we can push some airplanes forward, north, south, east, west, and prevent a catastrophe, that would be a huge benefit, obviously. In terms of the controlled reentry, that is something you need to ask permission. And what's going to happen when we have a crewed vehicle that needs to provide an emergency landing and needs to enter the airspace, will we allow that? Will we need to seek permission? And what are we going to do? And does that fall into the safe harbor regimes that, the, that we have set aside? I think if we learn how to do that in a non-obtrusive manner, where most of the time we're not being invasive to air traffic flow, when we have that one in a blue moon emergency, people will be understanding and work for the best interests of everyone. That's my naive view of the world. Thanks, and you know, I'd like to follow up on that and to go deeply down it, because we're talking about debris risk and safety risk, but there's commercial risk as well. And this growing tension between aviation and space for both launch and re-entry uh, is real. And, uh, you know, different stakeholders have different interests. What do we need to do to, to find that balance so that instead of it being competitive, um, we're sort of mitigating that commercial risk. And so, early when I showed the slide, I said, think about overriding a spaceport network, basically, over the airport. And what we have really is a multimodal system of systems. We have a system of systems at the NASA, I'll speak from the US perspective. Um, and then we have a system of systems development in the spaceport. Uh, what I find a little bit troubling is that the, the NASA is still defined uh, using, using airports, and yet we have airports that are now also air and space ports. So why don't we combine them? Why don't we have a national airspace system that includes space ports as it should be? And I think that would help bring together the communities and start forcing some of these issues, including the returning debris issue, although I can't really talk about the sovereignty, but I was thinking about what happened uh, with the, the shuttle disaster and how much debris fell um, over mainland USA. Um, and there was really no plan for that at that time of 
and go back. So I go back to, I think we need uh, a national airspace system that includes spaceports. So we're already going that way. And I think that will bring together the communities in a much more cohesive fashion and then hopefully also include you know, the procedures and the technologies and, and everything that belongs in an airspace system or the air and space system. So Nancy, you have a lot of experience with the tension between different operators and different operator types. What's the path forward to do that? Well, there is one interesting area that can serve as a laboratory for this. So I also worked for the FAA for many years, and so I felt the tension between the space and the aviation community. And it is, it has taken 15 years to really settle in. Um, but in the stratosphere, for example, we have high altitude platforms now. That's your laboratory. And it's, it's a little bit of space and a little bit of airspace. They're, you know, go through the airspace going up and they stay up there for a year at a time. Uh, and then they come down. Um, and that, in that arena, we have developed a concept of operations in the US, which I hope will translate to, to other countries. We're working very hard at that. But the idea there is that the, the air traffic controllers will not provide traditional air traffic control services, but will provide some ability for the community, the ability to foster the communication between operators for low density airspace. We can play around with that. Um, and we can learn in that environment. And I think that's one way where we have an opportunity to try out some of these notions. But I, I tend to agree with you. I think that as difficult as aviation is, and I honestly think the FAA is one of the most administrators of the most difficult jobs, I think, in Washington, I do think it's time to expand that to the broader physical space um, and, and have a home for that, um, not necessarily in the regulatory context, but in a coordination context. So I would agree with you. I don't know, um, I don't see that happening in the near term, it would make better sense for me, but uh, I think there's, there's still some discussion and some value that we need to propose as a result of that change because it, and it will be perceived as being perhaps negative on the aviation side. So I think we need to talk about what is the value and what are the losses that we're going to have. Thanks, Eddie. All right, yeah, so we've got Mark. So my question is for, for Nancy. I like your introductory remarks. And uh, so we had some experience with the UN system as well, Portland's, and we recognized that uh, other than the Alice Wing Treaty, not a lot has happened in the last several decades. In fact, many people in this audience were probably uh, weren't actually signed in the UN Treaty. Uh, but we looked, so Diane and our gals and Dave Kemmer, I published a paper at the NSC last year about what important what like you might be as treaty level documentation every three years of the UN thing. And so we, we, we cherish that we have specific ideas that they could they could take on, uh, namely uh, a persistence of agenda items and working on agenda items, as well as private sector delegate participation or private sector membership in the UN programs. Uh, I'd like to you know, amplify a little bit more some of your remarks on specific things that, for example, from the CAO, that Kobe's was taken on, that we would like to know about the uh, situation in the aviation industry and how it's expanding. Well, it's a lot to right. I, I would agree with you that I see you have probably the best model in my mind right now. ICAO needs to learn from ITU and how it's funded for the future. So there's some learning there for ICAO. Um, it's too big to learn for ICAO in that regard. Listen, in this world, you pay to play. That's the bottom line. And so in order for you to have a voice, you gotta pay. But you are paying, it's just an, an indirect way. So I would agree that ITU is a good model. Um, and if you cherry pick from that, you've done well. ICAO needs to do the same. I do think to not get into a turf battle between the ISA and ICAO, there needs to be that cooperative mechanism so that whatever you produce has a double logo on it. If you don't do that, then there's the argument about is it valid? Uh, and just make it easy on yourselves and double brand. So I, I like to cherry pick from what we need from the system as opposed to what the system can do to you, uh, which is grind you through the gears. So I think you cherry pick what you need. So the question is, is what do you actually need published that will support your operations and 
and amplify safety in the overall system. And then work together between Akela and ESA to double brand it and publish it as guidance. You don't need anybody to have oversight in order to do this. What you need is a cooperative secretariat on both parts, and you'll find that. But the learning group hasn't been given a mandate as to what you may need. So if you've cherry picked some things, put it forth in the learning group and let them do the work. I mean, ultimately you'll do the work. They just simply you know, send it through the system and, and have a lot of questions and then eventually it'll get published. But that guidance can be published by the secretariat without having to go through a whole series of uh, the machinations of guidance. Guidance is the key word here. So that is cherry picking from the best of what the UN can be without all the BS that's on top of it. Could you, if I could follow up on Mark, could you elaborate a little bit? Because guidance material is the secret sauce. How that originates, how it bubbles up from the bottom, being put into the system from interested parties or test areas or regional groups, how that, how that gets started. She's right. It is the secret sauce. And that's probably the biggest thing I learned there. It, it starts out with something called a manual or an early draft. And it's something that is generally bubbled up from the industry itself. It's a series of essentially best practices. Um, and it's, it's as a circular is sort of the earliest version of that, which is considered draft and it hangs around for a couple of years until you put it into practice and you get some massaging opportunities through that. And then it gets turned into a manual if it's needed. And then if it's, as it hardens and becomes more fast, it gets turned into a guidance material document, uh, manual plus, right? And that usually includes a series of definitions and best practices. Uh, and the states that are not leading states use it as regulation, but it's not regulation. So it doesn't go through the regulatory process and it doesn't get sliced and diced and sniffed and whipped uh, and to get through the system. You actually get to put out something that's useful immediately. But what you need is a multinational group that's working on that where there's consensus. The ICAO and USA can't do that for you. You have to work as a community external to those UN organizations and bring in something that you've already worked within your industry that's ready to be stamped and licked. And that is really what's the secret sauce that you need, in my view, without all the bureaucracy that goes on top. So pick what you need um, and foster the opportunity through that learning group. It's there already, and the mechanism is there. It's just a question of utilizing that. If you do that, you also won't get into this diplomatic argument about who has the responsibility or the regulatory capability for space. No one. So, and you don't want that, in my view. You need that as continued collaboration and continued cooperation. So that can go out to the states or countries as guidance without having to go through the diplomatic channels of approval through a council and a general assembly, et cetera, et cetera. So pick it is manual guidance material, best practices and definitions, so that you're speaking the same language with one another that's been coordinated through industry uh, and you can present as a community. Whatever flag you put that under, IAA or any other flag, pick one. But do that and slide it through the system uh, that's well greased for you without dealing with the drops. So it's a little bit of a, it is the secret sauce, it's a little bit of sleight of hand. That's what you need. So we had a few questions online as well. Uh, we have one from H.R. Zucker. Ruth, point noted. Has commerce and government organized serious gaming scenario to play out the story you shared? We need to get the air and space communities sitting side by side, exercising their respective policies and creating actions for the policy and regulatory gap. Question is, who pays and will orchestrate such a peri or periodic exercises so next time the pilot will know what center meant when a debris re-enters sovereign airspace. So I'm a moderator. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to give that to both Janet and to Therese. And Michael, I hope you were listening as well um, to talk about that. Therese, you did it first. Sure. So we mostly focus on the satellite, satellite operations piece in terms of what I work on for, with SIA from a regulatory perspective. But I think we would certainly you know, support uh, any sort of simulation that the US government would want to carry out um, through whether it's within the US government or through an FFRDC um, or any other logical stakeholder that might work on this. There's been a lot of interest um, from our operators 
uh, to encourage sustainability. Uh, some of them worked with the space sustainability rating system um, in the early days of formulating the rating system. And I think um, ha they've shown interest in uh, thinking about sustainability um, when thinking about launch providers. That's one of our space safety principles. Um, they're getting uh, questions in terms of a corporate responsibility standpoint um, from their stakeholders for public companies or also just, uh, you know, motivated um, CEOs uh, who think that this is important. So I, if someone comes up with this, I think we would have to explore it. That sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I actually didn't think much more to say other than to, to, to kind of go back in history and wonder, well, why, how have we done this before? You know, in terms of who pays, I think all all active stakeholders would be happy. I would hope to get together and and start working out these issues. I don't know if that answered the question, but oh, Michael. Well, I do know that Janet mentioned about the uh, debris of the Columbia accident and how that everyone stood around saying, "What do we do?" And I know from the NASA side they have certainly developed procedures and processes to address those scenarios and consider that risk in their space flight and are actively looking at the end of life for the International Space Station and how that will happen. So there are, uh, from the NASA perspective, they've certainly worked in those things and played out those scenarios. Uh, I think there's a general perception that this is a zero risk and not something we need to be focusing on in the myriad of problems. And uh, I've been trying to uh, rustle the feathers and get people's attention to think about it now while there's still years to plan for when this when we have these mega constellations and more crowded airspace as we certainly all anticipate. But I laud the efforts of those panelists that are speaking for also speaking uh, the same thing that I've been trying and Mark Skinner as well. So. This is actually a really good example of where you can use the learning. So from my point of view, what do you see in the community as the best method for re-entry? Um, and that needs to then translate into their practice as in their values to the education. But you've got to create it. What is it that you see? Put it on the table and then negotiate with the institution you need to talk to them. And then just put it into the ground. And that's just translated into eventually into their practice speech and their practice speech. Because it's not a surprise. The controller controller knows what to do. Some of that's been done already, that's for sure. But it's a good example of, of taking what you see as a need for the future and turning that into a practical exercise to quantify and turn to some level of guidance that supports your operations. So I would say to the uh, people from academia and the FFRDC, sometimes what you need is a convener and the participation of others. You guys are pretty good. You uh, actually answered his follow-up while he was doing it, that who would be ultimately, ultimately responsible to see this through and who would pay for it. The final question I have online is that it's from uh, Catherine Courtney, we need to learn from a century of managing air traffic to find ways of managing space traffic. Air traffic control was born out of necessity after a number of mid-air collisions resulting in fatalities in the early 1920s. How can we find a way to create the same urgent call to action without waiting for a major disaster? Well, here's what you don't do. You don't just take the aviation system and move away and the space system, that doesn't make any sense. So the aviation system came from the bottom up over a very long period of time. What we're seeing in the stratosphere is you cherry pick what needs the structure that needs to be put in place based on safety, but not everything else. So you don't need the traditional air traffic control services in the stratosphere. You need communication between operators and sub-separation between operators that can be validated by a regulator. But you don't need left, right, and it's frankly the crap thing that on the line is. So it's a question of, as you say, cherry picking from the existing system and honoring the spirit of why that regulation was put in place in the first place. Just the spirit, not the practice, just the spirit. So I, I think what you don't need is to just take the existing system and overlay it. What you need to do is look at it from a top down. What do you need as a system of systems? What can you take that makes sense? And the way that you calculate risk 
in my view, based on what I've learned from the space systems from AMOS and other areas, is much more robust than, than what we do in aviation at a very low level. So there's lots of things we can learn in aviation and put in practice in what you do. So I still think who who can call these meetings and who can you know who can talk to those guys with it? That's the challenge because that is one of the things that the UN does is ring the bell. And it's usually too late and it's too bureaucratic. So use the things called symposia or events that don't have the bureaucracy associated with it as a learning example and create a list of what's the top five things you need done uh, to support your space expansion over the next 10 years, years to come, um, and then put it to work. Since you mentioned the system of systems and cherry picking, and there really is, a, they're very, very similar, right? A system of systems has different independent, um, I was going to say not fully independent, but um, working units, right, that are then somewhat interconnected at a, at a top level. And so when you start talking about cherry picking, I can see where you can just focus into some of these subsystems, right? And then, and then you know, concentrate on the top five. And then work to the greater good at the, at the higher level. That makes sense. So I, I really like the concept of symposia and doing different simulations across industry, government, academia um, as a first step. And I, I think that's worked to some extent for on orbit um, spacecraft management uh, discussions so far. Um, I, th I think, you know, if we do come up with a very heavy regulatory approach, which was not the case of uh, the early days of aviation. Uh, we're going to encourage uh, companies to find flags of convenience, whether that's a different spaceport, even if it's in the US. Um, I know California at one point talked about uh, uh, putting taxes on companies based on the miles that they left Earth, um, which I think you know eventually died, um, <laughs> thankfully, but that could have lost California um, a lot of launches if that had taken place. Um, or, you know, pushing uh, these different companies abroad with all of the new spaceports um, that are coming up internationally. So we want to be really, I think, careful to think about the ramifications um, of any regulatory regime that uh, might be put in place. Something in the space industry that's not well defined is the concept of who moves as we're approaching a collision. Um, and that's become more complicated recently with uh, some actors like SpaceX introducing automated systems for their avoidance. Um, so what can the space industry take away from aviation or the management of who, uh, who moves, but also uh, management of some of these, these systems that take that power into their own hands? Well, I will tell, I'll give you my answer, but I will tell you that you don't have anybody more schooled in this than Dr. Stillwell. So she comes from the aviation community, but she also thinks the way you do. And that is a little bit unusual for an air traffic, no, it's a lot unusual for an air traffic controller. Okay, so let me just leave you with that. What we're learning in the high altitude arena, because I consider it more of a laboratory, is that what we take in is a performance and risk-based approach. So the performance of the craft essentially determines who moves, who can move, who has the capability to move. A slow moving balloon that's like a jellyfish uh, isn't going to be able to move as quickly as uh, something that looks like an aircraft that's a UAV. So in principle, that's the basis in aviation. Having said that, the people that, if they were really bad folks, like the loon people that have a bunch of balloons, and defunct now, but that they would take advantage of that, right, and sort of hog the airspace. So there's a fairness and equity portion of that uh, that has to eventually get put in place when you need it, but you don't need it today. When you need it, then it's going to have to be a question of uh, you know who pays for the use of that, etc. That's how it came through the aviation system over time. Who pays for that? But you don't need it today. I think in the, in the area of space, the best thing you can do for yourselves is agree on a policy between yourselves. Don't ask the government to do it for you. Please don't ask the government to do it for you. It's just never going to turn out well for you. I think as a community, if we can work together to agree on the, the priorities and who moves based on capabilities, as long as somebody's not gaming that system, that's the best thing you can do and have the government try to fight for you. Again, just with trust, right, with policy. Uh, guidance, you know, whatever, whatever flavor you want to put on it, but 
Do what you saw, treat yourself. So Therese, you're in film. Um, so I, I, I do like that concept a lot when thinking about maneuverability. Um, the one caveat I would say is there's a major economic component to this in space. Um, if you're spending the last of your fuel um, trying to maneuver around another satellite um, that is also maneuverable, um, there, you may run into some tension with, between operators there on who's going to you know, um, ha absorb that large cost. Also, you're, you may be dealing with non-maneuverable satellite active satellite uh, or space debris. Um, so there's certainly an economic component there that I think will uh, increase the tension on new maneuvers. Actually, I, I have a question for Nancy. Uh, you mentioned these agreements, and I, I believe there's already these are already in place in some cases, like NASA and SpaceX. I think have the agreement, correct? Okay, uh, we're, um, and I'm looking to my students because they look, they did a lot of research into this where uh, the agreement was that SpaceX moved, right? The commercial. So I'd like to bring just a little bit in from aviation on this is because uh, airplanes are maneuverable, but they're not all equally maneuverable. But there are also automated systems that intervene in collision avoidance. And there are different levels. There are coordinated and uncoordinated. So when we talk about um, who absorbs the cost, it isn't always all one or all another. Uh, coordinated movers can work with shared costs, and there are models in aviation to support that. So we have another question. Thank you, Nancy. The secret sauce. I'd really love to hear more about the There's there's a Senate bill. Being considered the uh, commercial or uh, it would have us with the space with no discussion and ways to regulate without regulating. So looking at the way the failed Canadian conventions that use recommended practices, as we promulgate a series of recommended practices by the president of the that is what is included in the future president, which is effective. And I think it's a question of the program evaluation of how you apply those recommended practices. Just the impact, assess the impact you have on the behavior of the company, I should say. So you then continue to improve how you apply the recommended practices. But then the second component is the regime and how you apply the recommended practices. And it's three things together to be a comprehensive program of practice. Is there a precedent for that? Is that Caden in the way that you promulgated those recommended practices and things like that? Yeah. That's a lot of questions. <laughs> so the methodology is at first the early manual of the circular that gives the parties guidance that at some point if necessary the terms of recommended practices that at some point if necessary the terms may need to be um, procedures or standards or something like that. And some are more cautious on the outside, but most of their guns are in the ordinary system that was developed for the first time. I don't think you need anywhere near recommended practices or standards yet. I could be wrong. So um, that's the path. In addition to that, uh, ICAO is one of the few organizations, and technically the only one, that actually has an audit system. That was something that was initiated by the US. Uh, it was the question of how do you, how well does a state or a country comply with the recommended practices and the standards, and they're audited on a basis. That's complicated. It doesn't equate to safety in the sense that it's it's not an operator, it's a question about the regulator, how well the regulator does their job of managing the industry. So it's uh, tangential and important, but it's not direct. So I wouldn't recommend that, but the, the methodology is there in terms of ongoing assessment. We've taken that to a different level with the um, international organizations, for example. Uh, rather than put in that kind of an auditory system to air navigation service providers and controllers, I sort of threatened CANSO, the Civil Air Navigation Services Organization, that if you don't put in your own mechanism where you assess yourselves, don't make me put in something that's gonna require the government to do it to you. So both the aviation community through the airlines, uh, through their own systems, they have their own auditory system as well. There's one for air navigation services that's sort of voluntary, and there's one for airports that's been very aggressive in how they partner, and they pick a, you know, a, a, an apprentice airport somewhere around the world, and 
work together on setting up their own workforce. So usually six men. So there's the methodology for getting good regulation. There's the methodology for continuing a self assessment, which is really practicing data management. And I think we in aviation have a lot to learn from how you do safety management. And, and, and you do it, you might say so much, maybe you do it more as a system than aviation does it as an individualized group of data things, right? We do not, we come from the bottom, we do not practice safety management long enough to give any relief to any of those one systems based on the safety capability of another. It's a different discussion for another day. But I think you have, and you have the capability to do that. You have, in your industry, far more ability to do the um, simulations. Um, and I see that when I work with Google's and the Amazon, et cetera. The ability to do the simulations that you have in your industry is phenomenal. So you can help us in aviation have more certainty as to what your part of the system, the brain terms of this in the aviation system, and vice versa. So I think there's, again, a lot to learn. How we put that in practice is yet to be perfected, but it's time. I really do think it's time. And we have time. We'll take one last question. Uh, I'll try to be brief. Uh, my question has to do with the That's it, man. <laughs> <laughs> Since the first meeting about uh, the luxury of being able to do information and state of the world, um, I, I keep thinking about the full 37 or full 39 thing. Uh, is there less to quality assurance and more to evaluate and then have to do the documentary phase or is that like manufacturing and operations? Uh, as a CEO of our you know, I'm really looking forward to the Working at Kia as a, uh, a way to raise awareness for them and help build information for them. So, uh, the, the, the state of the, the, the dire situation in orbit. Um, so, I was just wondering uh, what our, your thought process is in terms of the solicitation and going to make this topic of discussion more of an uh, industry. Before we go to Nancy, Michael, were you able to hear that question? Not at all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not at all. Um, you want you want to try to rephrase you it? You should rephrase it. I, I actually have no idea how to rephrase it. It's okay. been quite long. Um, can you just summarize it really quick, Matt? Yeah, the mic's not a bracelet. All right. Um, here we go. I see uh, the orbit debris assessment report as an opportunity uh, for the space industry to learn from the aviation industry in, uh, in terms of quality assurance and raising awareness within a company. And I was just wondering what um, the panel's thoughts were on that and what resources are readily available. Did you hear that, Michael? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, uh, we also realized that there has been a little bit of coordination. Uh, people have not sent errant signals to satellites in respect of, of others in the way, and we've done very well up until now from a communication perspective. And we have been uh, good stewards in terms of managing to this point. But I do think there's needs to be rules of the road. And I do think that uh, the proliferation of actors and international partners is driving that uh, so I do think that uh, now is the time to do that. And as you pointed out, I think people coming forward and suggesting the way to do this is a much better way to get it accomplished than just asking the government to set up rules. So we have just two minutes, and I want to give our panel, first of all, my gratitude. Thank you for being that new team that, that we really needed for this topic. Um, so you each have 30 seconds to say I would just say that I'm very optimistic about the future. I think that the rules will be managed, and I think that the majority of the actors are indeed good actors and are looking for a mutual solution together. So I don't think it's a matter of, of um, 
penalizing those. It's a matter of finding the best ways for us all to work together. And if you take that as an opportunity to be most efficient, then I think people will embrace that. Thank you, Nancy. Well, thank you very much for um, inviting me and appreciate the opportunity. I always learn something. Um, I guess two things. Uh, I very much am inspired and always have been by the work that you do in space. And I used to say in aviation, we've got to do something about bringing sexy back. Boy, excuse me, boy. Listen, you have all the sexy. You got it all. So you have to be willing to share the sexy with the aviation community, learn a little bit from them, and, and let us learn from you. So we've got to find ways to make that work. And also, we've got to come back to you. You bring such inspiration uh, because of the work that you do. We need to somehow reignite that um, for our own purposes, but also just for humanity as a whole. So thanks for having me. Great. Uh, thanks. I just want to reiterate the importance of developing these cross-sector groups, whether it's like simulations or having symposia, um, and those really being a path forward long before there would be any sort of regulatory regime. It's worked well in other components of the space industry, and I think we would be more than happy to participate. Um, and then in terms of including new actors, I think there's a big educational component to be done, and maybe where we need to think more um, about how we can encourage people to be good space actors, particularly on the reentry piece. Like, what can the US government do to encourage studies of materials uh, that will burn up in the Earth's atmosphere the, rather than re entering? What other steps can the US government take um, to help new space actors in space? Thanks. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. So, yeah, I guess I have two points. One, that aviation and space, of course, are, have been linked in history for forever. And so, when you mentioned your question earlier, I thought, you know, we should we should be learning from each other, if not more. I know we are, but but I think it needs to be intensified. And then the other thing, I'm just going to close with a, a story. Uh, I was here three years ago presenting uh, space launch impacts on airlines, and there was a woman that was sitting in the top corner, and she said at the end of it, "You're thinking about this all wrong," which was like, "Ooh, just spent two years doing this." Um, and I talked to her afterwards, and I said, "Can you tell me what you?" And she said, uh, begin at the end state. Begin at the end state. What do you want to see at the end state? And, and taking into account everything that everybody said, I keep thinking about the end state. You mentioned a planned trajectory today in your work. Planned trajectory, by definition, knows that you have an end state. You have satellites that you, those satellites are in their end state in orbit. Michael mentioned re-entry of debris as an end state. And so I go back to, we need to think about that end state and having aviation and space together. And I really am, uh, really do believe space needs to be incorporated into our national airspace system with, with space ports. And I think by definition, that to me, if you picture it together is our end state. I'd like to thank this panel. Um, I appreciate all your contributions. It was really enlightening. And uh, thank you so much for taking the time to share with us today.